Thanks. It really is an honor to be here and to participate in the venerable tradition of why I hate Django keynotes. But the thing is, I don't really hate Django. I just think it's kind of doomed. Um, or it might be doomed unless we take some corrective action now. Um, so I guess a bit about me first. Uh, some other millennium ago, I dropped out of college and raised some venture capital money and started a company called Tuneprint which ended up being one of several companies to simultaneously invent a technology called audio fingerprinting, which is the technology where I give you like a second or two of audio, and we search a database of all the music in the world, and I say, oh, it's that song. So the stuff that's used on YouTube to enforce IP property rights, not sure I feel about that. But more interestingly used to identify music on your phone, like with Shazam. After that, I was one of the original authors of Miro, which was originally known as Democracy, which is a desktop video client written almost entirely in Python. And that was a really fun project. That has some, some really cool stuff inside of it. Like it has this Python, real-time Python object database that does these declarative bindings from the database to these GUI views um, in a cross-platform way. Some cool stuff, especially for 04. And then I started another company called MixApp, MixApp lets you listen to music simultaneously with your friends on the internet over a, kind of this distributed peer-to-peer, real-time media network. And some people really loved it, but unfortunately we could never solve the licensing issues totally associated with it, so we finally had to shut that down. But it went through a couple of incarnations. It was originally a native client app, sort of in the same mold as Miro, and then was transitioned entirely to the web, so it was this very rich interactive web experience because we had to port all the features over for the desktop client. And then after that, I got a job at Asana, which is, I guess, particularly known for its Luna framework for building client-rendered web applications that update in real time. And Asana was a very interesting experience because they've just done some incredible work on this, like uh, many, many, many man years of research into how, how to do these applications well. And so now I have a new project, Meteor, with a couple of co-creators. And so Meteor is a <laughs> Meteor is a framework for building basically, you know, the same thing that Mirror was on the web, the same thing that MixApp was, the same thing that Asana is, which is rendering data on the client and pushing data from the server to the client to get a richer experience. And just to give kind of a barometer of how much interest there is in this way of doing things right now. Like, Meteor has only existed for a couple months, or at least only been public for a couple months, and we already have 12,000 Twitter followers, which compares favorably to the number of Twitter followers that Django has accrued over its whole existence. That's not because Meteor is better than Django or even because it's ready for production, but it's, uh, it's just because people are really curious. People are really out there searching for new solutions. Um, so, so why is this? Let's, let's take a look at history and see what we can learn from history. So history starts, history of life starts with bacteria um, 3,000 3, million years ago. And so for a long time, these bacteria were just like running through the oceans, doing whatever bacteria do, replicating, I guess. And a long period of very little change. And then there was some change. In a very short period of time, there was this explosion of weird animals living in the sea because the multicellular life thing like finally got nailed down all these weird critters, thousands and thousands of strange, improbable things. Kind of like how right now there are dozens of these little client-side MVC framework JavaScript things running around in the oceans of Hacker News. Uh, and, you know, that, that was an interesting period. Like, a lot of innovation, a lot of, like, crazy change, uh, which, you know. <laughs> then there's another traumatic period where they all died off. 96% of the things in the ocean all died, and we still don't know why, about 250 million years ago. But that cleared the way for the emergence of enormous land animals. That was exciting, a whole different other regime of living. And then they all got extinctified too. And you know that cleared the way for us, a comparative, comparatively insignificant event, really, in the grand scheme of things. And my main point in walking through this is to say, after periods of long stability, Things can change overnight, and things can change overnight in ways that it's sort of difficult to intuitively grasp. You think, that couldn't really happen, but, but suddenly it does. And just like that's true of natural history, it's also true 
of software and of application platforms, so of the technology stacks we used to build our applications. So the history of application platforms starts with mainframes. So mainframes, you've got these big racks of hardware, and they've got their databases, and they've got their CPUs all in a rack over here, and your applications run on those machines, and then you had these dumb terminals on your desktop, which were basically glorified typewriters. They had a little bit of intelligence, but not much, so the way these systems would work is the mainframe would render a screen like your form at the DMV or whatever, and send it down to, send this rendered screen down to the client, and so the client would then let you fill out a form or maybe press some keys or something, and then once you'd fill out the form and press submit, it would send that form back up to the server, and the server would do its thing and send down a whole new, whole new page for you. So that was the way things were. But then, computers got small and fast and cheap. That meant that everyone could have a computer on their desktop, and that, that really changed everything. That drove all those mainframe technologies to the brink of extinction. I mean, they still exist. There's still some COBOL running somewhere out there, but it's certainly not how we prefer to build most new applications today. And the reason for this is because if you can have a computer on your desktop, then you can have a much richer experience because the rendering is on the edge of the network, really close to you. You can have a much more pleasant experience. And that's what drove people to throw out their whole tech stacks and, and rebuild their applications on this new technology, even though they had massive investments in this old platform. Also just because platforms have a, have a life cycle, like they wear out. After a while, it's time for something new. People are ready to rewrite their, their applications. Anyway, this was an exciting time. It really looked like the way forward. Applications were getting more and more slicker and more and more sophisticated. And then the web came along, and the web was this very interesting reversion to mainframe technology because we're back to servers running the applications and sending rendered screens down to dumb terminals, except now they're called web browsers. And you fill out a form, and then you submit the form. It goes back to the server, which gives you another, you know, another screen. And this was a really hard sell in the 90s because people, people who had spent years selling their bosses on the idea that we need to rewrite, rewrite all of our software to be native because it's a better user experience, and now suddenly it's the opposite story. It's, oh, we need to move all the rendering back to the server but what drove it was the internet. The internet, it was so easy to distribute applications over the web. You could just type in a URL and press enter. It's this magical experience. No more mailing people CD-ROMs. Um, that it, it, it took over. So the interesting thing is the, there's been this oscillation about every 15 years, historically, in application platforms between thick clients and thin clients, between rendering on the server and rendering on the client between presentation on the wire and data on the wire. So it's, it's natural to ask the question, you know, the web is, you know, what, this was 94, 96, like we're, are we reaching the expiration date? Are we getting to the, the shelf life of the technologies, the 90s technologies we've been using? Is, are we gonna see the flip-flop? I would argue we, we will, we can, and in fact we have. So if you look at HTML5, HTML5 is about making web browsers as powerful as a computer. They can run software, they can render 3D graphics, they can store data, they can do anything that a, a desktop computer can do. And kind of convergent with that, you've got mobile. So mobile devices are computers that are small enough and fast enough and cheap enough to fit in your pocket. So they were always a native experience and they always fetched data instead of presentation out of the cloud. So lest this seem too hypothetical, like it's, it's already happening, you're already using it every day. So this is the Facebook photo viewer. Since most of you are human, you've used it. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool. Like, you can just press left and right, and like the photos just kind of fly by on your screen. There's no page loads. They appear instantly. It's really slick. So what's actually happening on the wire when I press the right arrow key to see the next photo? Well, you know, it's easy enough to check. Just open up Web Inspector, your favorite debugging tool, and look at the network activity pane and take a look at what you see. It's JSON. It's not HTML, it's not PJAX, you know. This is an application, this is a JavaScript application, even though it looks like a web page, that when you press the right arrow key, it grabs that event, it like is prefetching data, it's like maintaining this client-side data store of all these photos, and it's like lazily loading them, you know, over JSON, or, or by, by sending and receiving JSON with the server. So surely Facebook is just an anomaly, you know, there's, Weird people that have overinvested in technology and they're totally irrational to do this. No one else is doing this, right? Well, Twitter. Um, Twitter 
was in the news a lot around May when they, there's a headline, like they switched back to server-side rendering because client-side rendering had been a huge disaster or something. Well, it's true that they did switch back to server-side rendering for the initial page load, but, like for a lot of reasons, but when I scroll down my, my Twitter feed, if I just like take this page and I scroll down, look at what you see on the wire. It's all JSON. Like, yes, Twitter does use, like, I'm, I'm not a Twitter person, but like, based on just looking at it in Web Inspector, it does use server-side rendering for your initial page load to make it happen fast. But for the rest of your activity with the site, once the page is loaded, this is all, you know, JSON RPC. There's no HTML on the wire here. Just to belabor the point, how about Google Plus? You know, here's a great experience. I've got tabs on the left. I can, I can switch between things, and it like, feels like really solid and good. You know, you guessed it. You know, there it is. Like, all the text of those comments is coming down the wires, JSON, as structured data, and then this, this client-side code is putting it together into this, into this page and giving you this nice experience. So the really interesting thing is these aren't applications. Like, this isn't, this isn't a spreadsheet. This isn't your mail client. These are just bread and butter websites. This is the kind of stuff that 10 years ago you would have written in, like, or 15 years ago, you would have written in PHP and not th thought that very hard about it. Like, it's just your basic bread and butter content sites. So it's, it's not about making desktop applications on the web. This is about an evolution of what users expect just for every site on the web, like this snappy experience. So, the, and, the, and the key thing here, like the key sort of dividing line between the old and the new, I think, is look at what's on the wire. Is it HTML on the wire or is it data on the wire? And increasingly what we're seeing is people are sending data over the wire rather than presentation. So it's like we built the web in the 90s on HTML and HTTP, and now what's happening is it's, it's JSON. You know, we're sending, HTML is still there, but it's, it's more like the data model that's used on the client to represent the widget structure, like the DOM. It's not the way we're actually communicating over the network. That's being replaced by JSON, at least in some applications, but a growing number of applications. And in fact, the, the most valuable applications, the most strategic applications, where people have the biggest budgets and the most flexibility to pick whatever technologies they want to pick. And HTTP isn't faring so well either. Increasingly, I mean, HTTP is a great protocol for delivering static assets. It's a great protocol for taking something that changes occasionally and distributing it to many users and caching it. That was its original um, design use case, and it's still great for that. But increasingly, people are either using WebSockets or a WebSocket emulation layer to move this JSON data around because it's a more natural fit when you're doing something that looks a lot more like RPCs and less like moving these large static cacheable assets around. So this is kind of an interesting slide. You're probably thinking, you know, no way. Like, no way is the web going to be built on something other than HTML and HTTP. It's always been these things. It's always going to be these things in the future. I think what that misses is the, the time constant, because it turns out, like, this is just the latest step in a progression. It's just that, you know, the steps in this progression, you know, are, are decades. So any one person's career, you typically don't see that many of these transitions. But if we look back, you know, there was a generation of mainframe technology that was totally eradicated by PCs. There was a generation of PC client-server technology that was totally eradicated by the web. What's interesting is the technology has been as, the transition has been as graceful as it has been, right? Like, it's kind of changed out from underneath us incrementally, um, rather than being like, oh, everything's different. It's because we've been able to upgrade the web browsers in place. So, okay, if this is the way of the future, you know, why aren't you building apps this way? I would guess that most of the people in this audience use Django, and you mostly probably do your rendering on the server. You know, I, I would assert that it's probably because you don't have the tools to do it, because why can Facebook and Google and Twitter do it? Well, it's because they can throw massive teams of very experienced engineers at these problems and invest millions of dollars in custom solutions. Um, and that's why we've seen this stuff first for the most strategic, like most valuable features, like photos drive a lot of Facebook's numbers and growth. That's why, you know, that's where they put the most, you know, tender loving care in. Um, and so a lot of the, what tools do exist for this are mostly locked inside, locked inside these large organizations. And they're often like sort of intertangled with the applications that were built on top of them. But what are you gonna do when you don't have a choice? Because what's happening is 
the investments that the tier one internet properties are making in this technology is increasing user expectations. So increasingly users expect that stuff. They don't see why the rest of the web isn't as snappy and isn't, doesn't have all the little bits of polish that Facebook and Google and Twitter are like the sites they use for many hours a day. They don't see why most sites don't have that level of polish. And it's gonna look like in, in, in a couple years, if you build an application and you don't use this kind of technology in one form or another, it's gonna feel like a website from 2005. You know, it works, but it feels kind of janky. You know, it doesn't really have that like fresh, like, new application smell. There's a little bit of brand damage there. You're like, is this really what I, where I wanna do my banking? You know? um, you'll get new tools. You, know, you will find tools that let you do this stuff. So the question is, will Django be that tool? And the answer is, if Django figures out a way to fit into this world of client-side rendering, you know, it'll be Django. And if not, you know, <laughs> it won't be Django. So that's the fluff portion of the talk. Uh, I guess the other tradition for uh, the I hate Django keynote is to have some, put some meat on it. So I'm just gonna dive into this. Uh, I have a lot of material. I'll try to go through things fairly quickly to leave time for questions. And so we can focus on whatever people are most interested in talking about. Um, so I guess, generally, we learned a lot building Meteor. I wanna talk about some of the challenges we faced or patterns we ran into that might be interesting or useful in thinking about this stuff and, and how it should work in the Django-verse. So let's, let's get this one out of the way, JavaScript. Raise your hand if you love JavaScript. Wow, quite a few people. Raise your hand if you hate JavaScript. Wow, fewer people, I'm really surprised. Um, I love JavaScript. Let me tell you why I love Java JavaScript. It's a, it's a little thing called Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> by, by which I mean I don't really have a choice. Like it's, <laughs> it's what's in the browser, right? Why is it what's in the browser? Well, Netscape and Microsoft got in this huge fight. Uh, that fight basically poisoned the well when it came to web standards for a long time and we were stuck with whatever happened to be in the browser in the 90s. So there was a series of efforts to get languages other than JavaScript into the browser, please God, but none of them quite got critical mass. And um, we're stuck with that, at least for now. So what's good about JavaScript, looking on the bright side? Well, one thing is there's been massive investment in the tooling around JavaScript, because that is one thing we can fix. We can build better tools around JavaScript. And a lot of people have kind of accepted, I guess it's gonna be JavaScript for a while, we might as well make the most of it. So for example, there's some fantastic debuggers now um, inside Chrome, inside WebKit. And there's also a lot of the brightest compiler researchers in the world are working on making the JavaScript VMs better, the just-in-time uh, compilation environment. So um, Google and Apple and Microsoft are all investing enormous amounts of money in building the fastest JavaScript virtual machines they possibly can. And that, some of them have gotten very, very good. So there's a, a huge sort of leverage they have over things that don't have as many developer hours and don't have as many millions of dollars of compiler research behind them. And you know, I actually have grown to kind of like JavaScript because it's, it has some really broken features, but when you forget those features, it's, it's kind of like a lispy Lisp dialect with a C syntax. You've got closures, you can basically build whatever abstractions and patterns you want on top of that. That really appeals to me as a ex-Lisp dweeb. Um, it may not appeal to other people, but I like it. Um, basically, we just have to accept that JavaScript is what we have to do if we want to get onto the client, um, at least until the tooling improves further. And there's some really interesting stuff happening right now around, they're called source maps. So source maps are where I can write my application in one language and I can compile it to JavaScript but then when I open it in the debugger in the browser, I see my original source code. And so I can step through the original source code as if it was already, always written in the source code. And I don't really care that under the hood is JavaScript that's running. And this is the same thing that happened with C. Like C used to be this avant-garde language. It's like, oh, you know, it's too inefficient. Like you have to write machine code. Like a kernel could never be written in C. And that was one of the key innovations of Unix that you could write a kernel in C. That was also one of the key innovations of Oracle that you could write a database in C and it'd be portable. Anyway, um, C didn't have any debuggers for a while until source level debugging emerged where you can debug your application in GDB. And it's actually machine language, but it looks like it's C. You, know? you can step through the C, you can evaluate C expressions. I think we'll eventually get that for, for the browser, for JavaScript. 
even if we can never solve the problem, the standardization problem, the political problem of getting other languages into the browser, it only takes one browser author acting unilaterally to add really good debugging support. And that's probably enough for us to use Python or you know, our favorite languages in the browser to the extent that they compile down reasonably to the JavaScript VM. So if you're interested in this, the way to do it is just to get involved and like, you know, go out there and say, like, let's, let's make this work, because there's a lot of people working really hard on it right now. Uh, it's, in, it's in Nightly's for some browsers. The thing it doesn't have, it's in, still in a rudimentary form. The thing it doesn't have is the ability to evaluate an expression, say, or set a, a, a watch point, because there's no way to map those symbols back to the source language. But that must be doable because we did it with C. URLs, this is another thing that comes up a lot. Um, we don't want to break URLs. Cool URLs, URLs don't change. URLs are a, are a good part of the web. It turns out that this is mostly a solved problem. There's an API in HTML5 called push state, which lets you change the URL in the address bar and create and destroy history entries um, without reloading the page. So you can programmatically just change what's in the URL bar within certain reasonable restrictions, like staying on your domain, for example. And that means that we can decouple the idea of a URL that refers to a place you can go on the web from what that place is, like whether that's a static document or whether that's a, whether that's a state inside of an application that you can navigate to. And that's in, that's in a lot of browsers now. It's not quite universal. The one point I'd make is people had this idea that when you don't have push date, you should emulate it by putting things in the fragment, like the part after the hash mark of a URL. I think the general consensus right now is that that's a really bad idea. The reason for that is since the fragment isn't sent to the server when you do a request, the server doesn't know which page you're navigating to until after the page loads. That means it's really hard to make your site spiderable, and it's also really hard to make your page load quickly because you don't know what's going to be displayed until after the JavaScript is running on the client, so you can't get it right in the first page load. So don't do that. Um, the client-side data store, something you realize pretty quickly when you start to write these applications is, okay, I've got all this data that I shipped down from the server to the client that I'm gonna use to render my interface. Where do I keep it? Well, if your you know, backbone, for example, has these model classes you can store your stuff in, what you find is you write more and more complicated, more and more complicated applications is, you don't just wanna like, keep that data around, you wanna filter it, you wanna sort it. Pretty soon you wanna do all the things to it that you would do in a real database and you just end up with more and more things, more and more ad hoc little bits of stuff bolted onto the side. Like, you might as well use a real database. Like, you might as well use a real database API. You don't need to make up a new API, though. We've got great APIs, like, you know, SQL is battle-hardened. Like, long, lots of people, like, use and love, like, the Mongo and the Redis interfaces. So, what we do in Meteor is we make the same database API available on the client and the server, and the way we do it is we re-implement the databases in JavaScript, so we have a, we have a thing called mini Mongo, which is like MongoDB, except it's just a JavaScript object store, so not much on the database side, but it's got the same API as MongoDB. So if you want to filter or sort your data, you can use a familiar API that we basically know works for lots and lots of cases. Whatever you do, the, my main point is, don't think you're gonna get by with a couple of random model classes. Like eventually you're gonna need most of the things that a database gives you. Server side joins. This is another thing that trips people up their first time through this. So let's say I want to show my newsfeed page. I want to show all the stories, and I want to show all the comments on each story, right? Well, if you don't do this right, you end up doing n plus one queries. You do a first query to fetch everything, in all the stories, and then you do it, you know, one query per story to fetch all the comments. And you can kind of maybe sort of get by with that on the server, where the database is a couple milliseconds away but you really can't get by with that on the client at all. Like, you really can't do n plus one HTTP gets like to render like your newsfeed. That's not gonna fly. So the solution is you kind of have to step away from the REST model. Like REST is about this idea that a URL mapped to a particular object, that's a great conceptually pure idea. The problem is with the network in between those two things, and having hundreds of milliseconds of latency on the network, that's really um, a luxurious abstraction that we can't allow ourselves. So instead we have to think in terms of having endpoints that expose views, like all the data for the newsfeed, the pre-joined, all the stories and all the comments on those stories that user X can see. 
because there's just unfortunately not really any other solution. That's the reality of having the database and the application be 3,000 miles away. Distributed cache invalidation. This is a, a thorny one. You might better know this as the real-time problem. So this is basically the problem where when one user does something, you want to update the other users that are looking at that data. You want to push an update to their page. So not every site needs this, to be sure. But most sites benefit from it. Like, when I'm on Facebook, I don't really need to see if someone posts a comment on my newsfeed to see that comment appear in real time, but most people prefer it. It's nice. Um, use tastefully. Use not tastefully, it's, it's just terrible. But it's, it, um, it does typically enhance the user experience. It will increasingly be a requirement that you get from clients. So there's a fairly well understood way to do it. It's just a lot of work. I can go into detail in Q&A if people want. But basically, you set up a message bus that has a set of topics on it that you have to carefully design out. Whenever you do a write, you post a message to one of the topics saying, hey, I changed this stuff. And then all your model objects have to, when, a, when you're rendering a page and you do a read on something, it needs to keep track of all of those topics that it depends on. And then when something changes, it needs to push a, a note to the client saying, hey, you, know, you need to re render this stuff because one of your dependencies changed. So you can do that, it's just, it's a lot of work. This is, you, if this is your application, you're not going to finish it in a weekend. It's gonna be lots of work. So you really need a framework that automates the common cases, or at least makes it so that when you're just getting started, you can build without this stuff, and then you turn it on at a certain point in scaling and think it through, something like that. Um, there's, there's gotta be tool support for this. I think in the future, databases will support it natively. You'll be able to do a query and not just get the query results, but also get streaming like, oh, and now I just added a row, like five minutes later, oh, I changed this row. But, and there's some experiments for that. I don't really think they're ready for scalable production sites yet. But um, there are, like in Meteor, the approach we take is we provide reasonable defaults, so it will get you up and running with no code at the very beginning. And then as your app gets more complicated and we can't heuristically infer what you want in a way that's efficient enough that it scales, you can drop in these invalidation keys which basically let you manually plan out how it's going to be distributed across these topics. Latency compensation. So this is another tricky one. This is the problem where the user's done something. You want to reflect that on their screen immediately without waiting for a round trip to the server, to go to the server, have the server push the message back, and then, then update the screen. It sounds like a pretty trivial thing. The user should be able to wait a couple hundred milliseconds to see the comment they just posted in chat show up. In practice, it's incredibly grating to get this wrong. Like, it, it feels really bad. We didn't do this right in Mixapp, and it was, it was terrible. So I become a big believer in getting this right. So how do you get it right? Well. The thing that everyone does to start with is they just say, oh, it's a simple matter of programming. I'll just write a whole lot of jQuery. Whenever I do a request, I'll just go patch up that DOM. And when the response comes back, if it isn't what I expected, what I speculatively patched up the DOM to reflect, well, I'll just go patch it again. And that's fine if your application only has two buttons, but like pretty soon you find that all of your template code and all of your business logic, like server model code, has gotten sort of you know, turned inside out and duplicated in a bunch of like imperative jQuery code that's like patching up the DOM. And it definitely violates any sort of concept of once and only once, and it's a maintainability nightmare. Um, the first thing people typically try when they want to create a organized, systematized way to do this is master-master replication, where you say, all right, I'll just have a database. I'll write to the local database. That will drive the update of my local screen. And then I'll lazily synchronize that to the server, and lazily synchronize the server back to my client, and that's how all this stuff will percolate. And if there are any conflicts, I'll just have a conflict resolution procedure, and hey, great, that also solves my offline problem, because I could be disconnected for a couple weeks. The problem with this is it's very difficult to secure, because in a master-master replication scenario, like you typically trust the other node. When someone's replicating a bunch of changes to you, it's basically up to you to decide, well, is there any sequence of actions that were valid, like allowed, that they could have taken to generate that database state? And that is a very difficult problem. So that's, that's a, an anti-pattern in my opinion. For Meteor, we found a way to do it that is the same as the normal RPC model you've already used. And we do it by having an entirely cosmetic sort of temporary state while a method is in flight. 
that doesn't really affect the way your application works at all. What we do is we take a, when you invoke a method, do an RPC, we take a temporary fork of your database and we let you define a stub that runs to simulate the action on that, on that database, which can often be the same as the server-side code, incidentally, since you have the same database API on the client and the server. And then when the actual result comes back from the server, we just throw away that fork and snap the whole client back to the latest server revision. So it's totally cosmetic, it's just something the user sees. That's worked well for us. Updating the DOM, so you, as, as things are changing, you need to patch the DOM, typically, since you're not reloading the page. The old busted way to do this was a whole bunch of jQuery that would manually go patch up the DOM. It turns out that if you look at the history of GUI toolkits in the, in the native world, like if you look at how the direction that the Windows API took or the direction that like Qt or Coco took, you find that what happens is people build more and more complicated apps, they usually end up converting towards some kind of declarative way of setting up interfaces, typically based on bindings. So you declaratively say, oh, this should be matched to this data. I'm not going to write code to manually push the data in and take it out. I'm just going to declare that they should be kept in sync. And that's definitely the pattern that has followed on, the, on native clients, and I think it's what we're starting to see on the, on the web as well. Interoperability, so we, this, this direction of development is leading us toward an interoperability crisis because everyone's making up their own protocols to do all the things I've been talking about. And that's bad. That's bad because there's a lot of benefits from standardization. So these are benefits that we got in the HTTP era that if we're not careful, we're not going to get in this web JSON over WebSockets era. So some of the benefits of standardization of your wire protocol are having tooling, like you can have a caching proxy, for example, for HTTP. Nginx doesn't need to know whether you're using like Django or some other framework on the server. It doesn't need to know whether you're talking to Chrome or curl on the client. It can just do its, its, do its caching proxy thing. It's great. That's because HTTP is a standard protocol. When people speak their own random ad hoc protocols over WebSockets, we lose the opportunity to build this reusable server-side tooling. Another benefit of standardization is APIs. REST has worked really well, or more generally, HTTP APIs have worked really well. I can, like a very simple short spec tells me everything I need to know to go use the EC2 web interface. It's great. It's worlds apart from, oh, well, yeah, connect, to, connect your WebSocket to my WebSocket, and then here's a custom set of messages I made up for fetching data. It's complicated by the fact that this stuff is just more complicated to start with. So if we want to have APIs in the sense we've had them before, we're going to need a standard way of doing this. Right now, sites that have complicated stuff punt and just build a whole separate HTTP API. I don't think that's the future. Particularly if you, not want, particularly if you want server-side joins or real-time updates or latency compensation to work for the API clients as well as the privileged sort of native application or first-party application. The other thing is interchangeable parts are really important. HTTP is great because you can, you can bolt lots of different parts together. You can take what you like from each piece from each project and, and combine them to make your system. And interchangeable parts only work when there's a common interface. So my vision is if Meteor and Django can agree on how we should push data in, down to client-side apps with some really simple protocol, then that would be great because if you want the client bits of Meteor and the server bits of Django, that's fine. You know, it's, it's no problem to, to go ahead and do it. So, Re looking at this slide again in the context of that idea, it's really not WebSockets we want. We want another protocol on top of WebSockets that happens to have WebSockets that's transport. Maybe WebSockets is only one of several transports. Maybe it also has a TCP transport as well. So we've actually made such a protocol at Meteor. It's called DDP, Dynamic Data Protocol. So the Meteor client and the Meteor server just speak DDP. They don't know the other side is Meteor. It's a very simple protocol. The spec fits on about a page. People, we haven't really released the spec yet because there are some embarrassing parts to it, but uh, people have reverse engineered it out of the code and have already started making DDP clients for various languages. So I would be very excited if, whether it's DDP or something else, we can all work together to drive some standardization around that because that'll let our projects work together and interoperate. So can't we just use PJAX? You know, come on, like how hard can this be? Well, it reminds me of the Monty Python sketch. Like, you know, server-side rendering isn't dead, it's just resting. 
<laughs> it's pining for the fjords. So yeah, yeah, sure, you can use PJAX if your app is relatively simple, if you don't want to do that much clienty stuff. Uh, and it's a great solution for now. It's a great solution for simple stuff for now. But the problem is, as you start to make more and more complicated applications, like if you want to make anything that has as many buttons and knobs as Facebook or Google Plus or even Twitter, then you start finding there's like lots and lots and lots of little stuff you have to fix or work around or build on top of because it's not really a very natural way to do this. And what it reminds me of is uh, the ancient astronomers that said, oh, Earth must be at the center of the universe. Um, the problem is as you look at the night sky, you start to find more and more evidence that it's more complicated than that. And so you have to develop more and more complicated models. And pretty soon you built a really, really, really complicated thing um, to avoid kind of the natural abstraction or the natural pattern. Just my theory. It, it could be different, but that's what I've seen from my own experience over, you know, five or ten years building these systems and also uh, it's, it's what other people are shipping, like if you, if you open Web Inspector and look at the network traffic. So I think, I think Django has basically two possible paths forward in light of all of this. One is to crawl down the pipe and try to claim the front end too. So that means building all this stuff that I was just talking about. Meteor's MIT license, so you can take all any bits you might find in our repo that are useful, but you're going to need all these components. You're going to need client-side data stores. You're going to need this distributed cache and validation system. You're going to need a story for latency compensation. It's a lot of work. It's fun work. It's interesting work. Um, it's definitely the longer term perspective here, because there's an enormous amount of engineering to do engineering to do to get all this stuff right. And some surprisingly hard CS2, unfortunately, at this point, because a lot of it isn't super well understood. At least making it easy isn't, isn't super well understood. The other option is to double down on the back end and say, we're going to we're gonna make Django the best way to build the server component of these apps, and we're going to let the other guys duke it out for what's going to happen once the data gets down to the client. I think that's a totally viable approach also, and I think it's probably the, based on what I've seen and heard these last couple days, I think it's probably what I would recommend. I think that definitely server apps are going to be, the server side of applications are going to be written in many different languages. People want to do that. And I think there will be a natural winner for each language on the server, like for the components that you use to build these, the server component, the data serving component of these client side apps. So conclusions. Um, rendering is moving inexorably from the server to the client. So you can see this in terms of a big historical picture. You can see this in terms of the technical justifications for it. And you can see it in terms of what people are actually shipping today. It's you know, a glacier rolling across the landscape. Adapt or die, right? You need, you need a story or someone with a better story is going to be the dominant apex predator. And I think the best option is to interoperate with the other stuff that's out there because I think that going it alone is not going to be the winning strategy, but there's lots of opportunities because there's so much technology that needs to be built to make this new world work that there's going to be lots of opportunities to have successful projects and to take projects like Django in a direction that makes sense in this world. One final request. Let's keep it simple. Like, I think when we all got into programming, it was probably some magical experience where we built something and it felt direct and tangible and real to us. We did it, we made it work, we understood why it worked, and it was something we probably put together in a fairly short period of time and it was fun and exciting and awesome. And the way that we're gonna preserve that instead of letting this technology get so complicated that you, know, you can't build apps in weekends and like 16-year-olds you know, that you know, have a, a, a textbook and a dream like can't get an app online, the way we're gonna do that is by focusing on the developer experience. That means we have to think as much about what's the sequence of sort of emotions and ideas you encounter as you learn a technology or framework, and like what's your mental model for it, and does your mental model feel like tangible and, and fun? Focusing as much on that as we do on the technology. It's really easy to let the, what's technologically convenient dictate the user experience for developers, and I hope we don't do that because I want to give other people the same experiences that we had when we wrote our first applications. So I also hope if you haven't seen the Meteor screencast, you'll come check it out because I didn't go into any of the, you know, sort of our, some of the cool things that are possible with this because I wanted to 
stay under time and, and stick to Django. But if you haven't seen the screencast, you can check it out here. So thank you. So can you uh, give us a date you will have DDT, DDP published by as, a, as an open spec? The spec? Uh, no, I can't. And the reason for that is because we have, all of our cats are on fire and we're putting them out one at a time. And like, DDP is kind of like the least burnt cat. This is a terrible analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're going to ship off first. Um, as many people know, like the Meteor on trunk doesn't have any kind of author account support. However. We have a branch that is pretty mature that most people are working off now that has auth, and we really have to get that out the door. The other thing is we need to do some more experiments with getting DDP through proxies because, you know, we build, great, you've got a service process talking to a client. Well, there's a lot of stuff to think about when you are going through, um, going through a proxy and also when you think about what's the vision for how you build a scalable data center across multiple continents with this stuff. Does it scale right? So, we're not going to get all that right in the first release of the spec, but we're trying to not um, open the battle on too many fronts at once, so we'll probably take that on, I would guess, I, I don't know when, <laughs> when we have time. Um, you mentioned early on that uh, the Django's uh, templates and, and rendering on the server is, you know, kind of going to go away. Um, uh, I think a lot of what you said is, you know, we have the pieces to put a lot of this in place now. It's uh -huh. just, you know, you have to use multiple pieces. Um, one thing that I, I think we don't have right now is, is, a, is a good solution, uh, a dry solution to um, doing what Twitter's doing, where you're rendering the first page off the server and then doing real time after that. What, what do you see as a, as a you know, do, do you see it as a possibility that we might share templates between our server and our, you know, client side? Or, or how do you see that piece kind of working? So that's, the challenge there is to the extent that you are binding data into your template with code, how do you get that code to run on the client and the server? Because you can definitely make a templating language, like pick your favorite you know, handlebars or whatever you want, and compile and interpret that on both the client and the server. The problem is to the extent that you have helpers that are what actually get the data into the template, how do you share the code? And then once you've done that, that starts to induce a lot of other stuff like, oh, well, if we're sharing the code, we don't just need to share the language, we need to share the database API. So I think it just takes careful thought. I think if you want, you know, probably 100% semantic templating where you don't have any code is, may or may not be a realistic possibility. I think the question is, if you can cut the templates, so just data is being passed into the templates for the helpers and no code is being called, that's one way to do it. The other way is templating, it always sucks to lose your debugger, but it's kind of okay, like, t templating is one place where, like, there's less demand on a debugger. So if you did, if you had, like, a Python to JavaScript compiler, which is certainly something that's within the realm of possibility to write, I don't know if it's been written, then maybe you compile just the helper functions that are called by the, by the template into JavaScript, and you, you know, you, you suffer through the current, like, limitations of source-level debugging. Like, there, there, are ways, there are ways around it, I think, for sure. Just, like, have to enumerate all the possibilities and find the one that's least painful. All right. Thank you. Uh, as with a lot of the, as with a lot of the real time discussion, uh, you framed it in in pretty vast terms. I mean, you, you know, you showed us bacteria and kind of walked us through the history of life up until uh, real time on the web. Um, and you know, there are, there are some people that I think would probably probably perceive that as hyperbole. Uh -huh. uh, but I, so I, what I'm wondering is, what are sort of the deeper issues in the human condition? What are the features and bugs? Uh, of the world that you think are solved? And obviously you can't go into a super, you know, I, I, I know that's a huge question, but I guess just what are the like, you know, what are the few things that really have inspired you? What are the features or, or bugs that you're trying to fix with kind of the, the movement aspect? Oh, by real time? I mean, the reason why I walk through evolutionary history is I just wanted a, a metaphor, like because it's, it's hard to imagine that everything about the way we write applications is going to change. And, but it's, the thing is like big change does happen and it happens really quickly when it happens. I actually think that it's sort of interesting because we're chasing, we're chasing relatively small improvements in UX, I think right now, like snappier interfaces. I think in the future it opens the door to sort of an uncontemplated set of applications that we don't really understand yet. But honestly, like 
I'm doing this because, like, let's go back some slides. Um, I just kept on building the same thing over and over again. Like, ah, too many slides. Like, <laughs> all, all this stuff, like, not Toon Print, but basically everything I've worked on has had some, like, gimpy little version of Meteor in it. And it means that the projects that I want to make over the weekend, like, I can't. It, it, they take more than a weekend now because the web got too complicated. There's too many impedance mismatches and also just, like, the natural way that you would build something that feels like a, the kind of application you'd want to write um, is too hard. And kind of the immediate inspiration what, for doing this was we did Y Combinator last summer. We're going to make a, an iPad travel guide, and that totally didn't work at all. But in the process, we saw everyone around us, like all the other people who were trying to start web companies, struggling with Backbone and like Node.js and Socket.io, and just like trying to put all these pieces together. And it was, it was just the amount of time they were spending on this when they, this was like this life or death situation where they had to get their, you know, get some users and make their graph go up and to the right, like by demo day. It just really underscored the pain that people are feeling around just writing basic applications now. And the other, the other sort of, I suppose, experience I had was I was on a plane and I was talking to the guy that was, I was sitting next to and he said, he's a guy that has been writing software for, for many, many years, like worked, worked back in the PC era, wrote some interesting applications back then that you've heard of. And he, now he's out of it, he's like an account rep for IBM and he travels around and, and sells like enterprise software packages. But on the weekend, he, he still writes apps and he writes apps you know, in, in frameworks like Rails or Django to keep his hand in the game. Uh, and he, he's also been writing some mobile apps just to see what it's like, just to know. And he said, how would I write? How would I write one of these apps that renders on the client that I've been seeing? And it's like, oh, well, it's really simple. You just get your backbone and your Node.js and then your socket IO, and I guess you're gonna need a message bus. And it's like just this launching into this long explanation. He's like, okay, stop. Is there a book I can read? And I was like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> not really. And it's, it's gotten really inaccessible for people, I think. We have to take it back to that magical, joyful experience where you can throw something together in a couple hours and it basically works. So I, th I think that's the promise here. More people able to write more software faster. But it's kind of, you have to run really fast to stay in place because arguably that's where we were like in the 90s with PHP. It's just people's standards and expectations were so much lower. Um, on your interop slide, you had uh, Meteor and Angular and Ember. Uh -huh. um, DDP. Is that something that, that other uh, frameworks are embracing? And uh, uh, related to that, how can somebody on the server side get involved with sort of shaping that uh, to, to help move it forward uh, and provide alternate implementations? So I think the, um, the community that we've had the most conversations with is Angular, but that's more like, you know, we went to their meetup and had some fun conversations. Like it's, this is still in a really early stage. Like we're just snowed in and have to prioritize very carefully. So. Um, the, the way that I see this working in the, so I'm not sure who will build it first. We originally had planned to have Meteor run on top of Backbone as the front end component and we found that Backbone made the examples more complicated than I wanted and it was like too hard to explain to new developers. So that's why we built our real time templating system, Spark and all that stuff. So, but the, the vision for Meteor was always we'll give you a good data API, which is a JavaScript DDP library. And then it'll be very easy to bind that into whatever client side, you know, rendering stuff you want. And that's still, that's still the goal. And if other people don't write the connectors first, like we'll write them. And they're fairly small bindings. It's just, you know, it's dealing with the particulars of each of those frameworks. And on the server side, like it's, we're, we're still in the early stages. Like we definitely have, like there are definitely Meteor users that have reverse engineered the spec out of the source code and have written like little experiments that like work with other web frameworks. And it's, it's still very much the early days. I think the reality is a lot has to change inside your, so DDP is based on the idea of you make a subscription to a data set, a parameterized data set, like newsfeed for user X. And then DD, then you can, the server can push down, um, oh, here's some new, Here's some new story records. Here's some new comment records. Oh, I'm going to take these away. Oh, I'm going to update them. And you can turn on and off these subscriptions. It's basically a formalization of what you're probably doing already over WebSockets. But it's definitely kind of 
a different way of thinking about how the server component works than like the rest request response cycle. And I think there's still a lot of thinking to do about how to best fit it into a framework like Django. So the app servers that we have today that are going to back in this, um, this stuff that we use, ModWizGee and Daemon Mode, GUnicorn, uh, Tomcat, Mongrel, Pigeon, they're all fat and they're all slow. Uh -huh. So have you, do you have a recommendation as for the best one to use for this sort of thing to handle large numbers of, of concurrent connections? And is there anybody working in this field on the app server side to make things better for this sort of application? Thinking. I mean, it's, it's interesting because these apps inherently require, in a sense, a lot less resources from the server because typically a lot of your rendering load is now moved to the client, a lot of your interaction load is moved to the client. Also, you know, you typically start by First thing you have to do is solve the C10K problem, like how do I hold 10,000 connections or 100,000 connections in a single process? That drives you towards something like, today that drives you towards something like Node or Twisted to do it. And we found that we can really handle, like just with a Node process doing very little because the server tends to get a lot thinner in these apps, we can handle, like, we handled our, our, whole, our whole launch, our whole like funding announcement, like the full saturation of Hacker News and TechCrunch and like all the, you know, startup publications like on, on like one process, you know? It's, there's inherently less load on the server. On the other hand, depending on exactly what you do when it comes to writes, for example, then there can be a lot more load and that load tends to be load around the real time like data publication component. So exactly how that gets pushed into the database becomes a really critical issue. So the answer is, I don't know, I think, what we'll probably see is a period of time where people are experimenting with building things on top of really you know, thin layers like um, Twisted or Node or maybe even Tornado. And that will gradually get formalized into application servers. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to retrofit existing, um, existing server components to do this, but my hunch is that it involves terminating like, that's one of the hopes we have for the DDP proxy, that we can terminate all these, like, sockets at the boundary and then, do, like, do routing, like, fan out to, like, particular application servers in a way that's intelligent about caching all these data sets and also holds all the sockets for you so the back-end processes don't have to hold those, those, pro those sockets. So I think part of the answer is probably a tier in front, just like we did with HTTP, really. Cool. And that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. Thanks.